Yo, what's good, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another reaction video. We got craziest cartoon secrets you won't believe are true. It's by BMA. So let's check this out. Ah, uh, cartoons. They're what all childhoods are made of. However, we all have to grow up. And one thing life teaches us is that not everything is as it seems. The cartoons fuck? included. So today we'll be uncovering some hidden truths ranging from the practical Mickey Mouse animation that will blow your mind to the peculiar reasons the Simpsons. the Simpsons are yellow. We'll also check out the adult jokes you missed in Spongebob and a sprinkling of very for a bro. interpretations that all these shows legendary, bro. Ruin your childhood favorites forever. Oh, shit. So stick with Here me we go. and reveal some of the craziest and darkest cartoon secrets you won't believe are true. Daddy, Daddy issues. issues. Whoa, whoa. Since Daddy issues. In 1989, The Simpsons has certainly earned its place in pop culture's Hall of Fame. Okay. With a perfect mix of relatable family life moments and hilarious satire, mm. even predicting the future at times. Now, that Simpsons shit is crazy, though, like that they can actually do that shit. Entertainment. Needless to say, in its long-running history, a few strange mysteries have arisen with some remarkable theories attempting to explain them. For instance, the question of who Ralph Wiggum's real dad is. But Chief Wiggum is Ralph's dad, I'm sure you're exclaiming. But you just might be wrong. I mean, mm. think about it. The two of them bear virtually no resemblance. Sure, Ralph has similar features to his mom, Sarah, such as her eyes and nose, but he seems to have inherited none of Chief Clancy's ruggedly handsome good looks. Ain't no way, bro. Wiggum <laughs> isn't Ralph's father, then which Springfielder is? Mm. Well, for a while now, fans have had one gentleman caller on their Ooh. radar. Eddie, Chief Wiggum's colleague. And it makes sense, both he and Sarah would be naturally acquainted, not to mention that Eddie and Ralph have strikingly similar hairdos. Ooh. Of course, this is all just conjecture, right? Well, until recently, yes. But in season 34, episode Lisa the Boy Scout, the show writers actually address the rumors. Wait, for real? No, Eddie is Ralph's father. Look at the hair. Look at the hair. No, Clancy, I swear to you, it's not true. Oh snap! His breath smells like cat food. Okay, you got me. So there you Gosh! Go. Is in fact Ralph's dad. I ain't even know that. Sarah has some explaining to do. Oh snap! It turns out the clip okay. we just saw is from an episode that, according to the Simpsons wiki, isn't actually considered canon, meaning it was purely a self-aware throwaway joke. So right now the mystery seems to be officially unresolved. Bro, what? For the some fuck? peace of mind by contrast, there's no denying that my dad is my dad. We're <laughs> identical. This nigga, bro. Tricks of the Tricks trade. Tricks of the trade. By their very nature, cartoons aren't intended to be realistic. I mean, how many grand pianos have you been crushed by lately? Shit. I spoke too soon. But besides sky falling pianos, there's something distinctly unrealistic about classic cartoons. Their fingers. Just take notice of your favorite cartoon Yeah, they only characters. got four fingers. Chances are they only have four digits. Mm -hmm. There surely must be a reason for this, no? Well, around the early 20th century... When Did somebody get their finger cut off or something? It was a very costly process. In fact, adjusted for inflation, Disney's 1928 seven-minute short, Steamboat Willie, cost over $87,000. Dang! Now, granted, Pixar Ooh. movies nowadays That's cost crazy. as much as 100 thousand dollars per minute on your racks oh clicks are way more complex and disney has a ton more resources available now than it did back in the steamboat willy days back then disney animators had to be thrifty they realized that drawing just one less finger saved a ton of time which in turn saved heaps of moolah this cost smart effectiveness is part of the reason why classic cartoons look like well cartoons realism was just far too arduous and expensive so characters were aesthetically simple. It kind of fit, kind of fits the build, though. Sometimes animators have created similar shortcuts, such as Ursula the Octopus having only six tentacles instead of eight. Intriguingly, given that cartoon fingers need to be large enough to see individually, animators have also concluded that five fingers just don't look right. 
Walt Disney even said himself, if Mickey Mouse had five fingers, his hands would look yeah. like bunches of bananas. And that's an image no one wants to imagine. But speaking got a point of about hands, that. what is the deal with those gloves? What's he hiding? Hidden hand tattoos? Concealed magical ice powers? Great, Elsa. Rotten, infected claws from some rare rodent illness? No, Yo, calm no, down, buddy. No. While it's possible Mickey's fingers may look all kinds of weird under those gloves, there are a few official reasons classic cartoon characters like Mickey wear white gloves. Similar to the four-finger situation, drawing gloves was quicker and easier, which ultimately cut down costs. You see, hands present several time-consuming challenges, such as joints and nails. That's mm -hmm. why I don't have them. Gloves, on the other That's hand, why. pun yeah. fully intended, were an easy way for animators to convey hand gestures without the need to worry about finer details. It okay. also had to do with color. Colored TV wasn't mainstream until around the 1960s, and consequently, characters like Mickey Mouse began their life in black and white. For Bro, Mickey not Mickey starting twerking, yo. That was hands, up with his nose. Oh, that was his... Whoa. His black body, which can actually so his tail is connected to his nose. That's crazy. didn't yet have gloves. In addition to that, Walt also revealed in his 1957 biography that gloves were intended to make Mickey a rodent look a little more human. I guess the red pants weren't quite enough. Four fingers aside, can you spot anything that iconic cartoon characters like these three have in common? Yep, they each have something around their neck. Which, oh. as I'll explain, is completely... Yeah, what's up with that? In 1940, animation duo William Hanna and Joseph Barbera created mm -hmm. what is now a cartoon icon, Tom and Jerry. I love this show, bro. The pair if you guys Brothers never watched Tom and Jerry, bro, I, I suggest you guys go and watch that show. A classic. A Scooby classic, Doom, man. And the Jetsons, to name a few. Hanna-Barbera was going pedal to the metal, and it needed a way to streamline things, which was achieved by the unlikely addition of neck pieces. Hanna-Barbera discovered that if they added something around the neck to divide the head from the body, they could get away with animating only the head and using the same static drawing for the body when characters were stood still. Oh, Just wow. take notice here how both Wilma and Betty's bodies are completely still, while their heads, divided by their necklaces, are the only things moving. Pretty oh, that's clever, pretty huh? sick. Okay. There's no doubt these classic cartoonists were true masters of the phrase, why work smart harder when you can work smarter. Mm hmm. Okay. Colorful characters. Hey, I always Are wonder why the Simpsons, Simpsons were yellow. So iconic is their unique design. But do you actually know why they have yellow skin and such bizarre shaped heads? Nah. In 1985, producer James L. Brooks proposed that Matt Groening adapt his comic book strip Life in Hell for short animations to be featured on the Tracy Ullman show. Fearing that this might entail him giving up ownership of his characters, Matt decided to create something that? that this might entail him giving up ownership of his characters, Matt decided to create some new ones instead. You know, that the story weird goes that one day he was left waiting over an hour for a meeting, so he got to doodling. And that time he claims he created the Simpsons family, which was essentially based on his own. Matt's real life parents were called Homer and Margaret. He also oh, wow. had two little sisters, Lisa and Maggie and an older sister called Patty. And there's an argument to be made that Matt himself is Bart. After all, no one else seems to fit that mischievous slot, and Matt wrote a novel oh, wow. in high school where the main character was also called Bart Simpson. Now, of course, Groening's family didn't That's look pretty all that much like the Simpsons. In fact, I'd be pretty concerned if they did. Ew! Didn't look all that much like the Simpsons. In fact... Yo! Who made this, bro? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, they did. bro! I'm finna have so nightmares tonight because of that, bro. Haircuts and head shapes, even when compared to their fellow Springfield residents. Well, not only does it make them memorable to us, the audience, but it also distinguishes them from other Springfielders. They're the principal characters, and as such, they have the most exclusive design that cannot really be seen in any other characters. But the real mystery is, why are they yellow? Why aren't they normal skin color? Or why not blue or red or another arbitrary color? Well, aside from being an eye-catching color that gives the show a memorable, distinctive look, there's the fact that Bart, Lisa, and Maggie have no line to differentiate their hair from their skin. So the designers felt that yellow could kind of pass for hair and kind of pass for skin. So that's what they went with. Kind of like me. Okay. Well, I might look bald, but I actually have a ton of hair. It's just white. 
<laughs> Scooby Dooby yeah. Doo, where are you from? No, bro. Having been on our screen since no, 1969, Scooby Doo has certainly earned its legendary status. And this time it's had countless series, movies, and spin offs, which have all added to the rich Scooby lore. And they've all been pretty darn entertaining, that recent Velma show aside, of course. But we won't mention that. I never was that. But did you know the 2010 spinoff series Scooby Doo Mystery Incorporated revealed perhaps? Why the did they make her black though? The entire like series? in the new one. In the series, it's officially revealed that Scoob is actually an Anunnaki. What's that you say? Okay, well, in the show, the alien? Anunnaki are a race of extraterrestrial creatures, some of which are good, while others are pure evil and want to destroy the world. During a cosmic event known as Nibiru, which occurs every few thousand years, the barrier between the Anunnaki's world and our own grows weak, enabling them to visit Earth. Interestingly, the Anunnaki have no physical form of their own, so when they do visit Earth, they inhabit the bodies of various animals, which explain sentient ancient and mythological creatures. And one of these creatures is none other than Scooby-Doo. Yep. In the lore of the 2010 series, Scooby-Doo is literally an interdimensional alien. That Zoinks. is crazy so work, while we bro. we might be safe to assume that our old yeah. pal Scoob is one of the good Anunnaki's, we cannot be sure he's not one of the evil ones who's secretly plotting to destroy the world. Hmm, he would have gotten away with it too, if it wasn't for those meddling show writers giving him a completely new and off-the-cuff origin story. Nigga, really? <laughs> Secret crazy. siblings. Huh? Modern Disney films are loaded with Easter eggs, in the form of covert clues and references to past and upcoming movies. Oh, that's These pretty are usually sick. found lurking in the background and to the untrained eye go complete. That was the, oh, what the heck? Why they got Stitch in that bit? noticed. As a result of some of these Easter eggs, diehard fans often theorize that certain movies must exist within the same timeline. And to start us off, I feel a song coming on. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> I'm out like I, I didn't hear that, bro. I really am. I'm out like I did not hear that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, anyway, if you couldn't tell, this theory centers around Frozen. This 2013 box office smash features many a secret, including a guest appearance from Rapunzel from Tangled, Yo. post haircut, of course. But one secret is a little less easy to spot and notably darker. In the film, we see Elsa and Anna's parents go on a ship voyage where they ultimately meet their demise. But while we're led to believe that Elsa and Anna's parents died at sea, that might not be the truth. Mm -hmm. According to a popular theory, Why is that? they actually washed ashore on a jungle island. There they would have a little boy and start a new life. Alas, though, they would eventually be tragically devoured by a leopard, leaving their Ooh. defenseless baby orphaned. But then, in a crazy twist of fate, the baby would be raised by apes! What well, the wait, wait, fuck? Rewind. Isn't that just the plot of Tarzan? Meaning Tarzan is actually Elsa and Anna's brother? Yep, and yep. And while in movie evidence of this is somewhere between scarce and non-existent, don't be too quick to assume that this is just some theory schmeary fabricated by Redditors with too much time on their hands. It was actually shared Bro. by Chris Buck, who literally co-directed both movies. Naturally, people without lives, <laughs> I mean, Disney fans, have been quick to point out that the two stories don't perfectly align. Specifically in regards to character design, time period, and location. So are they are these siblings or not, purpose, bro? This is Stop just beating around the bush. Theory and not official canon to either of the films. Still, it's pretty fun to think that Tarzan and Frozen might be connected. I mean, just imagine. Hey, Elsa, Anna, great news! Your parents actually survived the shipwreck. Oh, but don't get too excited. They were brutally devoured by a leopard. Oh. Good news, though. <laughs> You have a brother. Yo. He was raised by apes and is currently flinging his own human waste at your dinner, yes. Ew. <laughs> Yikes. Let's move on. Bro. The Pixar, Pixar code. code. Sticking to the theme of cinema Bugs Easter life. eggs, 
A113 is perhaps one of the greatest and most exclusive ones there is. If you look close enough in almost every Pixar feature, you'll find this enigmatic code concealed in the depths of CGI. Wow. But what exactly does it mean? Yeah. Well, the answer takes us back to Pixar's origins. The spirit of Pixar was cultivated by names little such kids. as John Lasseter, Pete Doctor, bro. Andrew Stanton. Why do you put their face on little kids' These bodies, folks bro? Are all alumni of the prestigious California Institute of Arts. What's more, they and many future Pixar animators all learn their craft in the same classroom, A113. Oh. It was a dingy and cramped room, mind you, but nevertheless, Fuck. it was the place where Pixar would essentially be born. It's thought that Brad Bird began the fun tradition of hiding A113 in Disney films starting with 1987's The Brave Little Toaster. The, the Brave Little Toaster? The development of Pixar appearing in the studio's first feature, Toy Story. So A113 isn't some kind of covert Shannon code, Sharp. but rather a nod to the studio's oh, wow, okay. beginnings. So keep an eye out for I've never the even next really noticed Pixar flick you enjoy. The A113 thing. The reality of Nemo. Okay, so we've all seen Pixar's Bro, Finding Nemo, this, but did bro, you know that shit. Finding Nemo, if it were more realistically based on the real laws of nature, would be far less child-friendly? Let me paint you a picture, and fair warning, things are about to get kinda horrific. Marlon and his wife, Coral, were admiring the deep blue, when BAM! Out of nowhere, a barracuda gobbled up Coral in her nest of unhatched eggs. Bro. But wait, there was one left. This ray of hope. Marlin named Nemo. With Nemo born, there was only one thing left for Marlin to do. Make a swimmer with his eyes closed. And as Nemo grew into an adult fish himself, his mother Marlin suggested the unthinkable. That it was time for the two clown fish to have some children of their own. Hey, yo! Uh, wait, wait, stop. Cut. Uh, yeah. That might just be the worst thing I've ever had to narrate. But technically, Excuse me, wild, bro. this is pretty much exactly how it would have gone down. You see, clownfish are sequential hermaphrodites, meaning that they are all born biologically male, but can transform to become female to meet the needs of their... So species. they're the real transvestites. <laughs> Yo, oh my gosh. So, so, so they, they were... So, oh my gosh, bro. So they were, so they, so they were the first ever trans, um, but a part of the trans community. Hmm. Social okay. okay. Should the group's breeding female die as okay. Coral in Finding Nemo, the former breeding male that partner is. will change sex to replace So basically humans trying to be like fish in this bitch. Spring. Okay. Yikes. No wonder why Marlon was so desperate to find Nemo. Anyone got Child Protective Services number? <laughs> SpongeBob Secrets. SpongeBob Secrets. Oh, Pretty sure SpongeBob's got a lot of them. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, anyway, since hitting our screens in 1999, SpongeBob SquarePants has been. Hold up. Anyway, bro. Since the little kid, bro. What the parents at? Uh, what the parents at, bro? What the parents at? What a whoop her little ass, that. bro. Uh, anyway, since hitting our screens in 1999, SpongeBob SquarePants has become an icon. But it seems there's more favorite shows, man. the show than one silly little sponge's shenanigans. For example, did you know that the show is actually a big metaphor for environmental issues? Well, mm -hmm. that is at least according because didn't they like theory. blow up stuff like to, to where Bikini theorist, Bottom actually is? Personifies a different aspect of global warming and wider societal issues. Let me explain. SpongeBob, who resembles a human-made kitchen sponge more than the naturally occurring sponges of the sea, represents sea pollution. Ew. Meanwhile, Patrick, SpongeBob's incredibly stupid friend, is yeah. an, He's an instrument. instrument. I just watched that episode. He is said a couple to days represent ago. society's obliviousness to what's going on in terms of climate change and pollution. After all, he literally and metaphorically lives under a rock. Meanwhile, money-hungry Mr. Krabs is an embodiment of the big corporations, a.k.a. the main culprits of pollution. Hello, I like money. <laughs> and finally, perhaps the most relatable SpongeBob character, Squidward. Yep, Squidward, man. Oh, please. I have no soul. <laughs> this misunderstood cultural fiend is thought to represent liberalism. What with his artistic passions and enlightenment often ignored, Damn. if not ridiculed, leaving him forced to work for a corporation he dislikes. 
<laughs> We've all been there, Squid. While this socio-political and ecological bro. commentary is all just theory and not part of the show's canon, there are other hints in the show that might actually corroborate this. For example, just take a look at the houses in Bikini Bottom. I mean, what exactly are they? Well, some say they look a lot like car mufflers, potentially meaning that Bikini Bottom is so polluted that its residents have no option but to live in human trash. Wow. Do you think any of this checks out? The question I'm sure is on everyone's mind is, why does SpongeBob live in a pineapple? Nah, for real. The show then it, the then it, Steven Hillenberg. Didn't it get like dropped off of a boat or something? Cause I remember like it was in like part of like the first episode or whatever. Or in color. Um, pretty sure like somebody dropped the pineapple off of a boat and it fell on top of Squidward when when SpongeBob first moved in or something like that. That while things in the show might often seem random. Everything is quite thought out. For instance, much of the visual imagery is inspired by Hawaiian and Polynesian his, culture. Dick, bro. Lo and behold, pineapples are often a recurring motif in these cultures' art and fabrics. But besides that, Stephen also explained how he thought SpongeBob would simply like the smell of a pineapple. I mean, I get it. In the same vein, I'd like to live in a pot of Wendy's chili. Moving over to Squidward's humble abode, we can see how he bro. lives in what looks to be one of the famed Easter Island head statues. How one of those ended up under the sea remains a mystery. But what is interesting is that Squidward's home probably has a secret underground body. You see, while they're often referred to as just heads, but didn't it, Easter Island But like, I think this is not true because he they sunk his house one time and he didn't have a body under him, so... There goes that narrative. Actually have buried torsos, meaning our pal Squidward probably has a pretty gnarly basement. Though of all the real estate in Bikini Bottom, the Krusty Krab is not just odd. It's disturbing. Well, it it's in the shape the of a um, fast food joint, the Krusty Krab conceals crab a dark trap. secret. This, what you're looking at mm -hmm. right now, crab trap. is what the Krusty Krab is based on. And do you know what it is? Mm -hmm. Yep, it's a crab trap. But wait. Why would Mr. Krabs, a crab himself, set up shop in a crab trap? Well, that's where things get twisted. For over 20 years now, Plankton and fans alike have yearned to know the Krabby Patty's secret formula. Crab me, or and after being reportedly, or it could be Pearl's mother. That's the secret ingredient as well. He released on hmm. Nick.com, only to later be removed. The recipe states the patty is made from, and I quote, imitation crab meat. Imitation crab meat is typically made of pulverized whitefish, which already has pretty disturbing connotations, but with the Krusty Krab literally being a crab trap, I'm not all that convinced that it's imitation and not the real thing. So is Mr. Krabs a cannibal? Well, there's not enough Won't evidence put it past to say him. for sure, and the show's producers have more recently claimed Krabby Patty. Because why is he the only crab best. under the sea, bro? But I still don't sea, think bro. I'd be surprised about some wildly inaccurate ingredient labeling <clears throat> from this money-loving crustacean, would you? Disney Deja Vu. What the hell? Disney has been known to reuse the odd idea or two. I mean, being resurrected from the dead via acts of true love is just one of them. Sadly, no matter how many times I tried, that old Disney trick certainly didn't work on my hamster. <laughs> but the point is, it's not just plot lines Disney have recycled, but actual animation too. Don't believe me? Take a look. Oh, wow, bro. <laughs> they used the exact same animation. What the world, bro? Pretty mind-blowing, huh? And while the evidence is there in plain sight, the question is, why? For real? Well, rumor goes that in the 1970s, when Disney movies like Robin Hood came out, the studio was broke, and recycling old animations was a cheap way to make ends meet. Fair enough. However, Fair while enough. this would have certainly saved some time from designing mm. and planning new movement sequences, it isn't the whole truth. According to Floyd Norman, a Disney animator, Bro, the director like Steve of Robin Urkel. Hood and Winnie the Pooh, Wolfgang Reitherman wanted to play it safe by using animation he knew worked. You see, after Walt died in 1966, the R. studio essentially lost its guiding star. 
And well, it showed, as Disney's profits from their animation features began to decline. Mm. What Wolfgang was doing was perhaps an attempt to recapture some of the Walt Disney magic by sticking with the old charm. This is why some films from this period feature direct copies of the studio's older animations. It's kind of like some of the nostalgia-baiting unnecessary sequels we see today, only at least these Disney movies were pretending to be original. Not child-friendly. Yeah, SpongeBob has never been child-friendly. My mom loves to tell me that I need to stop being a deadbeat and watching kids' cartoons. However, it just so happens that many children's cartoons aren't all that child-friendly. Nope. Top suspect is Especially her old pal, SpongeBob. Mr. SquarePants. Throughout the series, his nautical nonsense has oftentimes resulted in some pretty adult jokes that, granted, went completely over our heads as kids. Not for real. Watching now, or I started to understand knows. SpongeBob a lot more. I mean, more just take now, a look bro. at this from the season two episode, "Your Shoes Untied." Oh yeah, I remember this. <laughs> he turned to football or something. Is that is that basically porn for him or uh, something? I was just looking for the sports channel, Gary. Dear God, of course, all we see is a dancing anemone. But judging by SpongeBob's sheer panic, <laughs> we can assume he may have been watching a sea creature's equivalent of a one-handed workout video. If you catch my drift. Bro, moving on to something <laughs> equally PG unfriendly. Bro, check out this scene from the season Bro, seven episode. Into it too. Thick. Oh my gosh. Is that supposed to be condoms? And just in case you still didn't get the joke, let's just say that those were not balloons. Wow, who knew Squidward would look so good in latex? <laughs> no idea how that one got past the sensor, but I suppose the sponge's prophylactics look just enough like balloons to slip through. Admittedly, it's not just the SpongeBob who's been up to no good. Donald Duck, too. And trigger warning. My boy Donald never Duck do the same way again. Looks like Donald just uh pitched a tent there. Thankfully, that uncomfortable image from 1947's Wide Open Spaces short film is later revealed to be a rock poking through Donald's sleeping mat Bro. And beyond. But it's safe to assume that those Disney animators had a good laugh, even if they have just ruined all of our childhoods. Yo, that's crazy. Protrusions that made for an awkward moment in a Disney cartoon. Take a look at these sausages in the background of the 1933 Three Little Pigs short. Yep. The three little pigs having a jig, all the while a portrait of their father immortalized in the form of sausage can be spotted in the background. Ah, I have a similar portrait of my late grandmother. Oh. Rest in s'mores, Grandma. Rest in s'mores. Bro. <laughs> Yo. Daddy, Daddy Doofenshmirtz. Doofenshmirtz. Nah, for real, cause I, I, there, there was this theory that, that um, Dr. Doofenshmirtz was Phineas's father, and um, the actual dad is Ferb's father, so... Was was the mom creeping around no, a little you bit? A, you know what I'm saying? You never know. Millennial or older, you might not be as familiar with this next one. Phineas and Ferb was a cartoon that first aired on the Disney Channel in 2007, with the premise being two stepbrothers who would embark on wild adventures and constructions each episode. During the series, we're never introduced to Phineas's biological dad and. While it's not an important part of the plot, it has left fans wondering who the mystery man might be. Phineas's head is distinctly triangular. In fact, if you look at both Phineas and Ferb, notice how their silhouettes reference their initials P and F. And while Phineas's triangular head is unique to him, there is one other character with a similar shaped head. Dr. Doofenshmirtz. You know, bah, bah, the bah. Been stop at nothing to rule the tri-state area. Of course, the initial resemblance might not be striking, but notice how they both not only have triangular heads, but little hair sprouts from the top. Fans have even extended the theory to Candace, Phineas's sister. From her slouching long neck to the fact that both she and Doofenshmirtz are lactose intolerant. But then again, an estimated 68% of the population also is. So I guess for now, Phineas and Candace's dad remains a long-necked triangular mystery. 
red, blue, and green. Powerpuff Girls. In the intro to the Powerpuff Girls, we're told that these superhuman gals were created in a lab made from sugar, spice, and everything nice. Not to mention the all-important chemical X, which bestowed them their superpowers. However, behind the scenes, Yo, there was actually this nigga's another funny, source of bro. inspiration, and it came from a Disney classic. <laughs> the three Powerpuff Girls each have distinctive personalities booted with their own trademark colors, red, blue, and green. And you know which other famous trio also share these same colors? <laughs> no, not Alvin and the Chipmunks. The fairies from Sleeping Beauty. Yep, even the Powerpuff Girls' personalities overlap with those of the fairies. Mm. There's the sweet one. I never watched Powerpuff Girls, so I wouldn't one. know. Perhaps you How would not know at all. The Sleeping Beauty fairies are the Powerpuff Girls grown up. After traveling through some kind of wacky MCU logic time portal to the medieval times, Bro, stranger things what? happened in that show. I mean, their main adversary was a talking monkey for crying out loud. Now think about this. What do you do when you're on public transport, cleaning your house, or you generally just can't stare at a screen? Do you still want to learn amazing facts and have your mind blown? Well, I've got the solution. Be Amazed is now available in podcast form. Look up Be Amazed on all major podcast platforms. Follow us now on the podcast platform of your choice, and you'll have the chance to win $500 of Amazon vouchers. Oh, yeah. We're giving you don't want me to win that. <laughs> Boy, lucky I'll winners. use all, all 500 of that up real quick. DMs on Facebook or Instagram with a screenshot showing that you follow the Be Amazed podcast and left a top rating. Hurry, the competition ends on the 30th of September. Winners will be chosen at random and announced via our Facebook page. And in wow, true Looney Tunes style. I was I was pretty interesting. I was pretty interesting. Um, hope you guys enjoyed. Um, if you did, make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe to the channel. If you're new, we're on the road to 100 subs. Um, make sure you guys turn on my post notifications so you get notified whenever I drop another banger video. Without further ado, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs>